So I obviously can't prove that Toy Story 2 is objectively better than Toy Story 3, or expect to radically change anyone's mind who very strongly feels the inverse. I'm not even sure how even controversial a stance this is. When I crowned Toy Story 2 in the top of my Pixar list, no one really fought that. It was mostly complaints about why Ratatouille and Incredibles weren't generally higher, which I get. But honestly, I've been wanting to do this video for a while, partially because I watched a review a really, really, really long time ago that barely matters now, that had the bizarre opinion that in the Toy Story trilogy, Toy Story 2 was optional. You somehow did not need to watch Toy Story 2 to watch Toy Story 3. Ha <laughs> ha where did Jesse come from? But this is honestly more of a thought experiment to justify why Toy Story 2 is my favorite Pixar movie, as well as explore all the personal, perceptional, and situational factors that can influence people's preferences for anything over anything else that has nothing to do with content. So I'm gonna start this by just flat out acknowledging my biases. Toy Story 2 came out first. I don't mean this in a first impressions kind of way. I mean, for those who watched Toy Story 2 in theaters in 99 and then Toy Story 3 in 2010. And it's literally just that when Toy Story 2 came out, I was a child. And when Toy Story 3 came out, I was significantly older. You all have probably noticed this, but when you watch things as a child, everything just seems better because you have less expectations, you're not burned down by cliches yet, but I was also old enough to get the emotional context, and in 99, Pixar did not have its god-tier reputation yet. But in 2010, now its divine reputation had persisted for over a decade, as had the reputations of both of the Toy Stories, and all had virtually become icons of worship. And because I did love Toy Story 2 so much pretty much since the beginning, obviously I was hyped to the highest levels for Toy Story 3. But I also had more judgmental movie knowledge and life experience to compare it to, which is a particularly big factor in the other problem. I've brought this up before, but Toy Story 3's ending doesn't really resonate with me personally. So yeah, kinda skipping right to the end here. It's pretty decently known now that whether it was deliberately calculated or purely accidental, the timing of Toy Story 3's release lines up impeccably for those who were kids when they saw Toy Stories 1 and 2 in theaters, would be around Andy's age when 3 came out, and would also be confronted by a lot of those feelings about moving away and letting go of your childhood and the agony of saying goodbye. And I was one of those kids. But the thing is, at my high school graduation, my feelings weren't so much sad as much as they were, later bitches, see you never. And as KP cited in our review, this notion that kids have to one day get rid of their toys, like, is that even still a thing anymore? I mean, in 20 years, those things are gonna be nostalgic and make bank. Plus, what if Andy wants to be a vlogger? What is he gonna put in the background of his videos? Oh, right, these days he'd just green screen it. I still think that Andy's words sound a little melodramatic in the way that he implies like they were alive the whole time. But though I didn't personally connect to it, I can of course still acknowledge that it is powerful. I mean, that defensive reflex and the little hand wave and Andy carrying Woody on his back. Because it's not about Andy being a self-insert, it's about Andy saying goodbye to these characters that we love and we know have done so much for him. Now playing this in comparison with the emotional highlight of 2, which is of course Jesse's song, being conveyed via montage with a devastating music number that ends in tragedy. Now this doesn't inherently make that more emotional, but what is true is that many anticipated that a tearjerker was coming in 3 given its concept. Again, the hype working a little against it. But Jesse's song? This came out of freaking nowhere. Family Films hadn't had a scene this devastating since Mufasa died. In addition, this was a sentiment that I related to. Because when I was a kid, I honestly could be a bit clingy? So this idea of my friends abandoning me and right at the age when I was realizing exactly how much things change over time, yeah, it kind of broke me. I know it's not the same, but I do want to acknowledge that the very ending of 2 with that final little infinity and beyond line between Woody and Buzz is one of the best moments of their friendship and especially sad given what happens in 4. But yeah, I know when it comes to consequences of 4, the ending of 3 is even more depressing. 
I mean, he didn't want to. He was going to take him with him and was just put on the spot when a child made googly eyes at him. And that's not even accounting for all of the various emotional bullets all throughout to, from Woody being shelved to the nightmare sequence, Buzz's confrontation, friend and me, all of those are really powerful moments. In addition, Woody's character changes much more between one and two than two and three. The original Toy Story wasn't just notable for its groundbreaking techniques, it was having a not completely likable protagonist. Nowadays, I can appreciate that, but it did make Woody's shift into a much more sympathetic likable good guy in two a really nice change of pace for me because honestly original Woody was a little disturbing even if he was better than his original conception am I hearing correctly you don't think I was right who said your job was to think I will say that having recently revisited it I kind of wish that Woody still had that manic energy that he has in one I mean that arm in the window scene is really like morosely funny now but when i was a kid that was literally one of the most horrifying things in the entire movie yes even more than sid's toys but at least in two we do see that he still has a little bit of that ego which is a nice touch but then from two to three there isn't that much of a significant evolution in woody's persona and then of course there's the behind the scenes stories of two about the creators saving it from the sequel oblivion of direct-to-video sequels and also how it almost lost all of its animation and had to be created from scratch. Okay, that's honestly not that important, it's just neat. And even the furnace sequence, as amazing as it is, I was kinda indirectly spoiled by a review that the toys weren't gonna die. Of course, that still could have been guessed by it being a Disney film, but even that slight what-if factor probably would have made a bit of a difference. And a couple quick notes that aren't flaws, they're just personal irritants. Like, as someone with a pretty decent auditory memory, Woody's delivery of the Dinosaur Eats Force Field Dogs line sounds so monotone in comparison to the way that Andy did it in one, and that never does not bother me. Also, I did used to be a kindergarten teacher, so while the whole manic daycare scene is very funny, I always partially look at this scene like, what teacher is letting this happen? Really? Your kids just run in from outside and just start grabbing toys and dunking them in paint? No transition, no washing hands, no circle time? I know that's not the point, it's just always where my mind goes. So obvious thing, the animation technology is more advanced in 3 and ergo has more character flexibility and expression range. Though credit that 2 looks as good as it does for how early it was made. I already talked about the villains in my Twist Villains video, and while I did rank the Prospector higher, that really was just because it was a better executed twist. And that part of the brilliance of that twist is because of how unimportant it made the Prospector look. He really did, for most of the movie, seem to fade into the background, especially in comparison to Jesse. But that he was able to do that while still delivering that great speech that got Woody to turn his back on Andy. He's a really great surprise and a great threat, he's just not a very memorable character, whereas Lotso really has a significant presence in 3. From just his look and his menacing persona, and that's before you get to his tragic backstory. And yes, 3 does have a superior opening sequence, an action-packed visualization of the experience that toys and their kids share together, with its first movie callbacks updated with its new characters. I do still think the Buzz opening is fun and adds a little bit of mystery, but it's just one character and part of what is a not unamusing, but least important arc of 2. And the furnace. 3 has the furnace. That's basically half the argument for 3. Huh, kinda feel like I gave 3 a little too much of a head start. Ah oh well, 2's still my favorite regardless. Stuff about 2 now! In the first movie, Woody and Buzz have one of the most believable transitions from animosity to friends that I've seen in anything. I really love friendship love stories and fun dynamic relationships. So it is a bit disappointing that in all of the sequels, we don't really see them play off each other as much again, because the two are always separated once the story gets going. But out of the three sequels, their friendship is easily on the biggest display in two, because of Buzz's determination to save Woody and pulling a flip on the first movie. Now it's Buzz's turn to bring Woody back to reality. They definitely still have some great moments in three. I like both of them leading the final staff meeting. But again, they're mostly separated 
separated. And then our Buzz is just straight up gone for a huge chunk of that movie so we can get diluted Buzz back. The friendship we do see take emphasis is now the tumultuous relationship between Woody and Jesse. The big essential spice of Toy Story 2. From joy to resentment to condescension to the vulnerability to gratitude to finally genuine affection. And I will not have any of this damsel BS. That ending was important because Jesse was left behind again in another box, but this time someone went back for her. I am so glad this didn't go romantic. Jesse has a lot of personality and range, and I feel like she was almost wasted in three, where she is now primarily a romantic target. And yeah, I agree, it's cute, but it's also like, is that it? That's a major point for two. There's a stronger emphasis on individual relationships, whereas in three, they act like a mass collective that can't stop saying the word together. Whatever happens, at least we'll all be together. Important now is we stay together. We stick together. Together. Yes, yes, magic of friendship, we get it. The filmmakers said frequently that they always wanted to bring back the gimmick of diluted spaceman buzz in each of the sequels. This was unnecessary. It was just their guaranteed comic relief gimmick for each sequel, which was both non-existent and the worst thing about 4. In 3, they made Spaceman Buzz an enemy, which was different, but a legit conflict. Spanish Buzz was fun for about a minute, but was pretty one note. I mean, the crush on Jesse is adorable, and I'm saying that, but the Spanish flirting during the heist, it's like, dude, we're doing a thing right now. And yeah, in the final movie, our Buzz is just gone for a huge chunk of the film. But in 2, it's not just a trial for our Buzz to overcome, granted mostly in in-between shots, but this film's diluted Spaceman Buzz is hilarious. I love every scene he's in and every line that he says, which is the other big advantage of 2. Toy Story 2 has so much amazing humor, and diluted buzz is a lot of them. Some of them are entire sequences like Crossing the Road or Woody's Roundup, plus Woody's Restoration, definitely part of a most satisfying compilation. But a lot of it is just its various small laughs, which is one of the advantages of just being a comedy, just all around having a sense of playfulness and cleverness with the script. Always appreciate playing around with the script. And the outtakes. I love Pixar outtakes, but I don't blame them for stopping. Now, if there was a particular moment or joke in TS2 that I can see people really disliking, it's probably the I am your father joke. I remember laughing my ass off at that when I was younger, but, you know, it's because I was a stupid kid. Reference humor wasn't as saturated in everything yet. But sure, by today's standards, it is definitely a little bit cringe. If it wasn't for its buildup and its follow-up, which I think still keeps it funny. The father line, the playing catch, like, if anything, that's just catharsis for Star Wars fans. Now, the entire subplot with Rex in the video game, it's not horrible, but it's just the least interesting part. But I do like how it just rounds up the diluted Buzz arc. But if we're talking about jokes that haven't aged well, we kinda need to mention Ken. And honestly, I'd say that 90% of Ken's material still really works. I think he and Barbie are super cute, torturing him with the clothes is still really funny, the way that they're both really stiff in their movements. Mocking Ken for being a girl's toy may be a bit dated, but it's also exactly the kind of thing that asshole villains would be an asshole about. It's really just things like the ending letter cringe gag. Like, nothing about that is funny, it wasn't even funny then. Anyway, it's clear that Toy Story 2 wins for comedy, but obviously it's because 3's focus was much more rooted in its tension and its darkness and its emotional devastation. So I can't really say that one is more than the other here because they're virtually different genres. And there's no denying the appreciation of a mainstream animated film that was more suspense and sentiment than laughs. So yeah, tone-wise, it's in what are you in the mood for thing. When you get down to it, the entire Sunnyside excursion is very exciting and traumatic, but did anyone, like, change substantially through it? Did anyone really learn anything outside of this nice girl named Bonnie exists? and don't get thrown in dumpsters. I mean, they leave because they think Andy doesn't like them, find they're mistaken, and then they go back. 
Then Woody has his literal last second revelation. Purely on just the filmmaking and screen time devoted to it, it's just not quite as impactful. Part of that is the narrative divide between the story being about the toy's connection to Andy, but everything in the daycare being about the toy's connection to each other. But two is completely about Woody's connection to Andy. And that connection is challenged. Woody really has to face his fear of abandonment and doubt and think about what his role is and how he wants to spend the rest of his life. To the point where he falters and abandons Andy before he can be abandoned. But then he comes out the other side stronger in his convictions. Possibly to the point that in 3, he's maybe even a little overzealous. The scene of him watching Woody's roundup may seem a little bit like milking it, but I love that just through the subtleties of his face, you can really see his mindset shifting all through the various stages. Now, he definitely has something like this on a smaller scale in 3. 3 continues the series constant of Woody needing to confront some form of his self-centeredness, where he has to make a choice between Andy and saving the other toys. It's just a much shorter arc. And you know, that part where he has to let go of his entire reason for existing. Yeah, a completely unimportant moment that I'm sure didn't break the heart of every single parent. The big theme in 3 is about major changes in life and how people react to them. At the beginning, all of the characters are very scared and resistant, especially in the case of Lotso, who reacts exceptionally badly, to the point that he makes everyone else's life miserable. But at the end, everyone is much more at peace and willing to accept the next stages in life. But why do they think that way? Because honestly, this is the reading that seems to be more backed up by the text. Now, of course, many a theory and analysis of Toy Story has associated the humans with gods and toys as their followers or even servants. So 3 starts with all of the toys deciding to strike out on their own rather than being locked in an attic for however long, only to have terrible thing after terrible thing happen to them, until they end up in literal toy hell. It's like the entire story is punishing the toys for abandoning their god. Literally, the very first thing that's said after the toys are rescued from the furnace is apologies and desire to go back to their master. Also that they're saved from damnation from abandoning their god by another toy's devotion to their god. I also remember this point where Jessie is looking at Andy's name on her boot and thinking like, what is the point of this moment? Probably, gee, if I had just stayed at my place and didn't make any of my own proactive life decisions, I wouldn't be in this mess right now. I mean, I guess it could be just guilt that they didn't have complete faith in their god when it's revealed that he did love them the whole time, which still clouds the whole letting go of the past thing 3's got going on. A decision that Woody ultimately makes for them, but in fairness it's both a sign that he's thinking of them for a change, and acknowledging that one traumatic experience doesn't mean that every alternative life path is invalid. I mean the daycare is fine now, but I guess PTSD and all that. While both 2 and 3 have coinciding plot threads, 2 breaks them up into much smaller segments, flips back and forth between them more often, and includes a bigger variety of locations. And the 2 threads converge much later than they do in 3. This gives the sensation that just a lot more is happening in 2. Because I remember watching 3 and getting to the heist and thinking, wait, are we at the climax already? This movie felt really short. Which of course we weren't because the heist goes on for a while and we still have the dump, the furnace, and the goodbye. But just because of that structure, 2 feels a little bit better paced. And not like this really matters, but the big reason that 3's ending is powerful is because it's a culmination of the journey over the whole trilogy. In other words, that scene isn't as powerful unless you've watched 1 and 2. It can still work, but it's not going to be as effective especially since the rest of 3 only has a little bit to do with Andy. Whereas 2, outside of a couple of callbacks that make it work better, most of the emotional moments work just as well even if you haven't seen the first Toy Story, making 2 a better standalone movie. And finally, one aspect where it might seem that TS2 is at a bit of a disadvantage to the other two is the middle child syndrome in terms of legacy. The first one will always be remembered as the one that burned CGI animation and created the world of Toy Story, and 3 will always be remembered as the one with the heart-shattering conclusion to one of cinema's greatest trilogies, 
but two arguably made Pixar what it is. The first two movies were fun and novel for the landscape at the time, but two particularly Jesse Song really nailed Pixar's reputation for storytelling and instigated its tendency for tearjerkers in the family market. This all ended a lot more evenly than I thought it would when I started this topic. Which isn't that surprising, because these are two of the best movies that have ever been made. So, Animaniacs, comedy or suspense? Agony over rejection or separation? Character connection or literal fire and brimstone? Then again, why would we choose when we already have both and both are incredible? This was just my mind rambling. Let me know your mind rambles. Comment, like, subscribe, etc. And you stay shiny, Animaniacs.